19th century India presents a grim specter. On one hand was the rise of the British power and its ever increasing control. And on the other hand was the Indian society which was riddled with many different evil social and cultural practices. In this circumstance, Indians were compelled, they were forced to go inwards, to reflect and try to analyze why they had landed up in this situation. This analysis, diagnosis and solutions that Indians came up with led to the development of socio-religious reform movements in India. These socio-religious reform movements not only crusaded against the evils of the society, of the religion, but also became the crucible in which modern nationalist consciousness was forged in India. And therefore, as students of modern Indian history, it is crucial for us to understand the history of socio-religious reform movements in India without which we cannot fully comprehend the development of our freedom struggle. Therefore, in this lecture, guys, I, Jawad Kazi, in the Modern Indian History series, today we'll be discussing the context of socio-religious reform movements and the early efforts, especially under the leadership of Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. Let's dive in and get started. First and foremost, let me just have this quote understood by all of you, dear students. Swami Vivekanand says, Liberty in thought and action is the only condition of life, growth and well-being. Liberty in thought and action is the only condition of life, growth and well-being. Where it does not exist, the man, the race and the nation must go down. Swami Vivekanand clearly is highlighting here the importance of liberty. That is that absence of restraint. The ability for an individual to enjoy his life to the fullest. To develop his personality to its fullest potential. And this in many ways is at the core of socio-religious reform movements guys. The evil practices that had been entrenched over the centuries had had a stifling effect on the personality of Indians in those centuries. And consequently, we could not develop ourselves to the fullest possible extent, allowing the Britishers, other Western powers, to interfere and establish their rule here in India. In this context now, let us dive in and try to understand what were the specific conditions existing at that point of time. Let us first talk about the background of socio-religious reform movements in the 19th century. The first and most important factor, of course, is the establishment of the Western rule. The sheer shock of a power that had come from 20,000 nautical miles away. The white British race had established its rule here in India, despite being so few in numbers. They were able to control a subcontinent that was many times over the size of their motherland. The whole population of Britain at that time was less than, the f less than 5% of the population in the Indian subcontinent. Yet, they were able to control this huge landmass, an area which boasted of civilizational history going back several millennia. Naturally, this gave a root shock, a jolt to Indians. It compelled them to look inwards and try to find out what was wrong within them which allowed the Britishers to do this. This introspection led to the birth of consciousness about backwardness and degeneration that had crept in the Indian society. No doubt India had been a proud, very highly advanced civilization in earlier times. But over the centuries, a lot of degeneration had crept in and consequently, this gave the opportunity for a more advanced civilization to come and establish rule over Indians. This rule was a very, very interfering sort of rule. The Britishers believed in the idea of white man's burden. 
The concept here means, white man's burden means, that the white races have the responsibility of civilizing other races of the world in Asia and Africa particularly. The British therefore considered themselves to be on a higher pedestal vis-a-vis -vis Indians with the responsibility of civilizing Indians. Many people in those times even had the attitude that these other brown and black races were actually subhuman and we would be civilizing them in this process. Naturally, this was an affront for a civilization of that sort of an antiquity like India. The hegemony that the Britishers tried to establish over Indian minds through every means possible, in every interaction of the British state and Indians, that hegemony was stressed upon. The hegemony basically wanted to tell Indians that they are superior and Indians cannot fight and defeat them. This was based on the idea of racism, the white races inherently being born with higher virtues. They were more intelligent, they were more moral and they were stronger and braver than Indians is what was being implied over here. In this process, the Britishers also tried to implement many reformist measures in India. Although well-meaning, these reformist measures were seen by Indians as interference in their religious and other internal issues. <clears throat> Indians felt that the British state did not have any right to dictate to Indians what sort of socio, cultural and religious practices they must have. This led to a lot of revulsion against the Britishers. One good thing that the Britishers did, although for their own benefit, was introduction of modern education. The Macaulay Minute of 1835 had firmly established the idea that Indians had to be trained and educated on modern western lines. The Anglicist side had won in that debate versus the oriental or occidental style or occidental type of education. Consequently, we'll see many ideas of the west, modern western ideas, they were introduced to Indians. The idea of rationalism, the idea of universalism, the idea of secularism, the idea of humanism, all of these ideas were introduced to Indians through the education that the Britishers brought about. Naturally, this animated the Indians and gave them a new lens to introspect their own society. This also increased the awareness of Indians about what was happening in different parts of the world. Indians came to know about the important developments that had taken place in recent centuries in Europe. They understood the development of political you know, history in Britain, how democracy was maturing in Britain, how France through a revolution had fought for liberty, equality and fraternity. What was meant by nation and nation state was understood by Indians through the study of European and American history. This also was supplemented by emergence of new economic forces. British rule in India had disrupted the traditional economic structure. And this disruption had led to emergence of new structures in India. We will now see the rise of a new middle class intelligentsia. A middle class intelligentsia which is educated on western lines and has ambitions for a better life not only for itself, but also for its fellow countrymen. This middle class intelligentsia will lead to development of different socio-religious reform movements. They will become the leaders of these movements. Later, this same intelligentsia will also lead the freedom struggle under Indian National Congress. The colonial economy had led to the understanding of exploitative nature of British rule and the need to first put our house in order, to reform ourselves, to be able to have a confrontation with the Britishers. So British measures themselves facilitated in many ways the development of this movement. Uniquely in India, we will see the clubbing of religious and socio-cultural aspects. Unlike in Europe, where we first see a renaissance, and then after that, a reformation. Renaissance refers to rebirth or rekindling of 
interest in the ancient times, trying to understand the achievements of the past. And later on will come reformation in the form of challenge to the uh, Catholic Church of that time. But in case of India, we will see that these two will get enmeshed. The Indian Renaissance will show elements of both. Like you have in Europe, Renaissance and Reformation as two separate movements. In case of India, we will see intermingling of these two together. This was natural because in India, religion formed a very inseparable part of the society. And consequently, the social reforms, the cultural reforms could not be affected without reform in the religion. And therefore, these two get enmeshed with each other. The religious reforms as well as reforms related to society and culture, they flow together in case of India. They could not be divested. And therefore, we will see that these socio-religious reform movements will lead to a higher plane of consciousness for Indians. Out of this higher consciousness will be fostered the idea of modern Indian nationalism. Modern Indian nationalism. As the socio-religious reform movements deepen, this consciousness will turn Indians towards the desire for greater and greater self-rule. Socio-religious reform movements were thus born in this unique context in India. Before we go ahead and try to understand what were the evils in the Indian society and how the reforms movement fought against them, let me tell you about a very important announcement for you. We have commenced our special Dasera sale and you can now avail our P2I batch at never before discounted prices, dear students. Till 25th of October, you can enroll into the P2I batch of study IQ IAS through these different validity programs. The batch is available in all the three mediums as usual in English, in English as well as in Hindi medium. And you can take these batches with special validities of 18, 30 and 42 months depending on when you are targeting your civil services examination. The batch with 18 months validity or the silver validity will be available at just 21,000 for you up to 25th October. The gold validity stands at 24,000 and the platinum validity at 27,000 So with platinum validity, you can watch the videos and avail all other facilities till 42 months. For the gold, it is for 30 months and for the silver validity, it is for 18 months. So now based on your specific need, you can enroll the batch so that you can make the most of this time. This is a great opportunity that you must not let go by because the offer is only till 25th of October. This is a special Dasera sale and never before discounts are being offered in this particular sale. So make the most of this opportunity guys and enroll right away using my code JDLIVE. You can get this special discount only on using my code JDLIVE. As I have been telling you throughout, the P2I batch is a one-stop solution for all your needs for the civil services examination. It includes end-to-end -end coverage of the syllabus and prelims, mains, interview related approaches are all covered in one single batch only so that you don't have to prepare you know, in a different way for each of these stages. The first stage of the batch is called as the foundation stage where we try to build up your foundation for this exam. The second stage is where we deal with the prelims examination so that you are confident enough to handle the MCQs. It includes test series, special material for preparing prelims, a lot of daily and weekly tests, current affairs modules, so on and so forth. After the prelims exams, those students who appear for the mains will get a free mains residential program also from study IQ IS. In Delhi, under the guidance of teachers and mentors, your mains preparation will be taken care of so that you can handle the main stage of this exam effectively. 
And finally, those candidates who qualify for the interview, they will be given special interview guidance program so that they come out with flying colors in the final stage of this exam. Long story short, this is an awesome opportunity that you just can't let go by. There wouldn't be a better offer than this. So enroll right away, my dear students. All right, now let's go ahead and see what were some of the social and religious evils that were practiced back then in the Indian society. These social, religious and cultural evils are ones that you are familiar with based on your uh, you know, history, education during your school times also. So let us have a quick and brief overview about these evils. Indian society was riddled with different superstitious ideas. Ideas which do not stand the testimony of or the touchstone of rationality. Such ideas are called as superstitious. For example, the birth of a girl child was considered inauspicious and many parents were heartless enough to actually kill the girl child. There were many places in the country where human sacrifice, especially children, were sacrificed for the sake of pleasing God. Many such superstitious practices existed in the society back then. The ritualistic and ceremonial nature of the religion, which, you know, actually benefited only the priestly class, also led to a lot of exploitation of the common masses. God or that supernatural entity became more and more distant from the common masses and in between was a priestly class that was officiating over all of these rituals and ceremonies which became more and more elaborate, more complex and more expensive over the centuries. This was just a form of exploitation of the masses by the priestly class. The sacrifices that were associated with religion were nothing but a form of extortion of the common masses credulity. Naturally, all of this was being done by the priestly class so that it can arrogate all the power with itself. Masses were illiterate in these times and therefore not in a position to understand how they were being cheated and exploited. Apart from this, there were many other social evils also. Women particularly, women and girl child were at the receiving end of the unfairness and unjustness of those times. They were subjugated socially, economically and politically. They did not have an equal status in the society. They did not have opportunities to develop themselves to the fullest. Child marriage was very common. Girls as young as 7, 8 and 9 were also married off to men who were several times over to them in terms of age. Polygamy was common both in Hindus and Muslims where one man married multiple women. The practice of Kulinism in Bengal was particularly cruel where one single man was married to several women, sometimes in dozens also. Very often the age of the man used to be very advanced whereas the girls that were being married were barely 8, 9 and 10. The practice of Sati where the Woman was considered a virtuous woman if she, you know, sacrificed her life on the funeral pyre of her husband. Was also another evil practice that led to a lot of subjugation of women. Very often women were forced and compelled to go sati for the sake of family's honor. There was no concept of widow remarriage. Girls as young as 9 and 10 married to men who were way older than them often led to widows being produced. Naturally, many of these widows had become widows even before they reached puberty. Back then, the expectancy of life was very low. There used to be epidemics, wars and many other challenges. Medical advancement was also very limited and consequently, men often died uh, you know, in big numbers during the course of these epidemics and wars, leaving behind the women that they had married or rather I should say the girls whom they had married. Now these girls were either supposed to go sati or if not they were condemned to perpetually living as widows. This naturally led to a lot of exploitation of women. The caste system had divided the society into multiple layers with rigid rules not allowing the individual to rise higher up in the society. A person born in a particular caste was condemned to the occupation that that caste practice. 
he did not have an opportunity to actually rise higher by developing his innate talents and the most unfortunate lot was that of those who were considered outside the pale of the caste system these were the untouchables considered so impure that even their presence was polluting they were not to interact with the society and had to live outside the boundaries of the village these kind of inhuman distinctions were practiced in the 19th century naturally when indians will start to reflect and look at the indian society from the prism of new ideas all of these glaring lacunas will stand out and these glaring lacunas will lead to the birth of movements for socio religious reforms these socio religious reform movements will broadly be of two types the first type in that is a reformist type of movements what were the reformist movements reformist movements wanted to bring about reforms within the existing social and religious structures and beliefs reformist movement did not feel that we need to go back to some ancient great past yes we have a structure right now and there are some problems in it we need to remove the problems and supplant it with new structures and ideas these reformist movements in many ways were inspired by western thoughts and ideas wherever these reformers felt that a western idea was superior to the indian belief system they were happy to adopt it they did not feel any sort of uh, inferiority complex while doing so they tried to synthesize the best of both east and the west orient and the occident east and the western civilization examples of this would be raja ram mohan roy's brahmo samaj and aligarh movement of sir sayed ahmed khan the second type of movement apart from reformist movement were known as the revivalist movements these revivalist movements differed from the reformist movements in the sense that they wanted to hark back or go back to earlier times when some so called ideal state existed as in there was a point where the society was completely perfect and if we revert back to the systems and practices of those times then all the social evils of our times will be eradicated was the belief of the revivalists the current problems they felt were due to corruption of that original religion or that original state if that why is if that corruption is removed and if we go back to the original religion as it was supposed to be practiced then automatically all the problems will be solved unlike the reformists they did not believe in western values and ideas and they did not have any sense of you know inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the west in fact they believed that the western civilization was inferior to that of the indian civilization arya samaj and deoband movement amongst muslims can be cited as examples of revivalist movements all right now one thing that we must understand here is guys that although this distinction helps us to classify and understand the movements better we cannot classify any particular movement as 100% reformist and 100% revivalist there will be certain qualities in a reformist movement which will be similar to a revivalist one and vice versa there will be some qualities in a revivalist movements which will be similar to a reformist one so it's not like a watertight compartment that segregates these two types of movements this is more like a theoretical construct for us to understand so please bear that in mind when we will go and discuss individually these movements specifically now let us see the key ideas that the movements prioritized the first idea in that is rationalism the idea of rationalism emerged in the west in the west in the wake of the renaissance and the scientific revolution rationalism basically says that any thought or idea will be approved or believed only if it can stand to the touchstone of reason what we call as tark in hindi if only an idea can stand the rigor of 
तर्क और लॉजिक और रीजन ओनली देन इट विल बी एक्सेप्टेड ह्यूमन रीजन इज सुप्रीम विदाउट सैटिस्फाइंग दैट रीजन वी के नॉट एक्सेप्ट द आइडिया just because some religious text has said it or some religious authority has said it it is not going to become automatically acceptable is what rationalism says second is scientific temper it goes very close to rationalism the difference being science works not just on reason it works on evidence empiricism it works on things that are quantifiable so scientific temper basically means ideas faiths beliefs will be accepted only if they can satisfy scientific temper okay they must be empirically proved rationalism is about human reason tark or logic whereas scientific temper is about imp empirical evidence behind the ideas and thoughts third is humanism unlike the medieval times where emphasis was on the other world where it was about swarg and nark heaven and hell where it was pleasing the almighty being the only goal of life humanism says that this life that we have the earthly existence that we have should be our focus the material resources the wealth around us is not something evil we are here on this earth and we should make the most of this opportunity about this human life not the celestial one the human one that is the focus of the idea of humanism not other worldliness but this worldliness not about celestial but about terrestrial that is the idea humanism fourth is universalism here universalism basically means a religious universalism religious universalism hints at the idea that basically all the religions at the core talk about the same fundamental truth what differs is the nitty gritty the practices if we overlook the nitty gritties and the practices and focus on principles and core ideas then all the religions are talking about the same thing that is universalism many of these reform movements will be focusing on one or more of these ideas so these are the concepts that we must know as we enter into the socio religious reform movements now let us briefly see what will be the methods that these reform movements will employ for the sake of bringing about a transformation the first method in that is trying to change the attitude of the individual socio religious reform movements would understand that society is composed of individuals a society will change only if the individual will change and therefore these movements will always appeal to the individual to change from being wedded to the old ideas to accepting the new ones and this change will be attempted to be brought about by appealing to the individual's rationality to make him understand how reason or logic supports the new ideas rather than the old ones the old ideas are based on dogmas whereas the new ones are satisfying the touchstone of reason and hence individual must accept these ideas literature education were extensively employed by these movements to convince the individuals and collectively the society all of these early socio religious reform movements will extensively produce literature arguing their case for reforms take the case of raja ram mohan roy's tohfatul muwahidin raja ram mohan roy was a monotheist and to convince people about the essence about the monotheism he wrote the booklet tohfatul muwahidin or gift to the monotheists in this manner many of these socio religious reformers they wrote such books they wrote articles they came out with newspapers so that their ideas could be popularized they also used traditional scriptures to prove or refute certain things prove their ideas and refute the ideas of the old practices raja ram mohan rai for instance would argue that sati 
is not a part of the Hindu scriptures and he used to go to the ghats where Sati was being practiced with the scriptures and challenged anybody to show to him where Sati as such was mentioned. So, proving your point or refuting the idea of others was done using traditional scriptures itself. This was a powerful way to convince the others about the falseness of their stand. Apart from this, many of them did missionary social work by providing services to the people, like for example, the untouchable, women and other weaker sections of the society so that their condition could be improved. Also, many of these reformers relied on government support for their work. They appealed to the government to pass laws and rules which will enable the stopping of some evil practices. The abolition of Sati Act in 1828, the Widow Remarriage Act of 1856, the Age of Consent Act, many such measures were brought about with the help of government legislation. These and many other methods were used by these reformers so that the Indian society could be reformed. The most famous amongst all of these, the pioneer, the initiator of these movements and a man who had a very, very broad canvas when it came to the Indian socio-religious reforms is none other than Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And it is no wonder then that he is often called as the first reformer in India and also called as father of Indian Renaissance. Indian Renaissance is basically the socio-religious movements in the 19th century that brought about an intellectual awakening amongst Indians. Raja Ram Mohan Roy is a pioneer of these movements. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, by the way, was given this title of Raja by Mughal ruler Akbar II. He stands for a unity of Orient and Occidental cultures. East and West, trying to combine the best of these two. A highly erudite or educated man, he had studied Indian civilizational ethos, its culture, history and also that of the West. He was a man who was self-assured and confident about the greatness of Indian civilization and at the same time conscious about the weaknesses, about the evil practices that had crept in. His self-belief, his assuredness about greatness of India, did not, it enabled him to accept what was good in the West. And therefore, he tried to imbibe some of the good ideas from the West into the Indian way of life. And that's why he represents that happy mix of both Orient and the Occident. A versatile genius with modern scientific approach, he was a man very well read in different languages. He is a true polyglot who could speak many vernacular, classical and foreign languages. He not only spoke Bengali, Urdu, Persian but also Arabic. He could speak, he had studied Latin, Greek and he had even studied Hebrew language to understand the Old Testament in the Bible. That was the level of his intellectual rigor, guys, so you can understand why he is considered as, you know, the founder, the father of these movements. That's why we call him as a true polyglot. He instilled the idea of modern national consciousness amongst Indians through his work. This idea of modern Indian nationalism will be the driving force of the freedom struggle later. This idea could not have come before it was infused in the socio-religious reform movements by gentlemen like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and others. Therefore, socio-religious reform movements will also have a great impact on the freedom struggle. He was a true internationalist who was updated with the developments of his times. He knew very well about the French Revolution about the subsequent developments in Europe. He knew about the American Revolution, the birth of that country and the political currents of those times. He was widely traveled and had even represent 
Mughal represented Mughal ruler Akbar Shah the second before the Britishers. So this was the man, guys, who is now going to initiate the practices against uh, the reform movements against various evil practices. So what all did he stand up against? Well, practically everything. Raja Ram Mohan Roy's canvas is so vast that he has actually touched upon all the evil practices of those times. And later on, his successors will pick and choose on some of the areas that they will specialize and focus upon. But as a founder, he did not leave out anything largely and covered almost all the evil things or evil practices of those times. These included, he opposed idolatry. He believed that, you know, God is one. He was a monotheist and felt that God could not be you know, withheld in a defined shape or image. And therefore, he opposed the practice of idolatry. He felt the system of casteism was inhuman and it had led to a lot of exploitation of humans by fellow human beings. He therefore stood staunchly against this practice which undermined the dignity of individuals. He also opposed the idea of rituals meaningless rituals which were just a tool of exploitation by the priestly class of the common people. He therefore opposed these rituals and believed rather you know, in an intimate contact with God directly by the believer. He fought against priestly caste, caste domination which had claimed a monopoly of being the intermediary between the lay believer and God. Raja Ram Mohan Roy felt that there was no need of this intermediary class. An individual could have direct communication with God based on his faith and beliefs. He upheld monotheism. The word monotheism is derived from two root words. Mono which means one and theos which means God. Theos means God. So the idea of monotheism basically means that there is just one God. Raja Ram Mohan Roy presented evidence from Vedas and Upanishads to emphasize his point that essentially at the core, the Indian civilization is monotheistic. The Hindu belief is monotheistic in his view. He wrote a book in Persian, a booklet, Tohfatul Muwahideen, Gift to the Monotheists in 1805 which argued about the ideas of monotheism. He was also inspired by the moral message of the life of Jesus. Ever the rationalist that he was, he was very inspired by the moral message of the life of Jesus, but at the same time, he was not uncritical about it. He subjected the Christian beliefs to the idea of rationalism and presented a critique. But at the same time, not denying the reformatory role that Jesus himself had played. He believed in the power of human reason, that is rationalism. And that should be the ultimate touchstone before anything is accepted by us. This is the thought that Raja Ram Mohan Roy gives. He was naturally not you know, accepted by the then society. A society that was orthodox. A society that was steeped in medievalism. For them, Raja Ram Mohan Roy was a bitter pill to swallow. And they reacted in characteristic manner. He was declared as a heretic. Heretic is a person who has renounced the faith in the traditional manner. And therefore, such people are often, you know, boycotted socially. So he was made an outcast because of his faiths and beliefs. In fact, many people from very close to his, uh, you know, within his family also so, uh, boycotted Raja Ram Mohan Roy. But this did not deter him from his ideas. This is what is integrity, guys. Integrity is your commitment to your values irrespective of the situation. Okay. You don't compromise on your core beliefs and values just because situation around you is difficult or challenging. Even when his mother had boycotted him, he continued to affirm the faith in certain beliefs and ideas. Raja Ram Mohan Roy was particularly appalled at the condition of women 
in India. He condemned the subjugation of women and the inferior status that India or you know back then the society provided to women. Of course, these are very early times. So Raja Ram Mohan Roy and his influence is going to be largely felt in Bengal only. It will take some time for the ideas to you know reach the other parts of the subcontinent. Nevertheless, it was very significant in terms of a pioneering role. He opposed practices like polygamy, early marriage, and sati. He's going to oppose sati very strongly. When he saw that his appeals were not having an influence on people, despite arguing logically, despite writing quite persuasively, people still continued with the practice of sati. That is when he decided that the government's interference is necessary to stop this practice. He wrote directly to Governor General of Bengal, William Bentinck. Back then, he was still Governor General of Bengal, not yet of India. Charter Act of 1833 is still some distance away, some time away. So he wrote and argued with William Bentinck that this practice needs to be stopped. William Bentinck, ever the reformer, Governor General, utilitarian, a Benthamite, he was naturally also himself appalled at this practice and he was resolved, determined to actually stop Sati in India. He made a lot of background studies, sought opinion of all important people, the army, the police, the civil administration. And when he felt that there won't be a major backlash which Britishers cannot control, he finally abolished a Sati in 1829. A small context we must remember guys, during William Bentinck's earlier stint as governor of Madras, the white mutiny, the mutiny in East India Company's army had taken place in Vellore. He was criticized and his tenure was cut short for having been very adamant with his ideas. And therefore, it was natural for him to be more circumspect later when he becomes governor general of Bengal. He therefore ensured that there will not be a backlash and if it, even if it is, it will be controllable and only then he abolished the practice of Sati. Rajaram Mohan Roy was a progressive man for, you know, not just his times, but also for, you know, many later decades. He advocated equal property rights for the girl as much as the boy. So son and daughter should have the same rights of property is his stance. He also took efforts for women's education, although it will be some time before things materialize, but he definitely pursued and advocated for providing education to women. Now let us take some of the measures that he took in terms of education. In his view, modern education was necessary for Indians. Himself, the erudite person that he was, he felt that modern education was the panacea, the silver bullet for all that ails the Indian society. And therefore, he very passionately argued in favor of modern education for, Indi uh, for Indians. He was a firm believer in Western scientific development. This requires that clarity and confidence, guys. On one side, he believes in the greatness of Eastern civilization. And yet, at the same time, he is ready to concede the advancement of Western scientific development and advocate that for India and Indians. He helped David Hare, who had come to Calcutta, to establish Hindu College in 1817. David Hare went on to become an educationist and it, he was early, earlier supported by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. He established an English school in Calcutta and later will establish the famous Vedant College in 1825. So these were some of his very significant contributions in the field of education. It wasn't as if Raja Ram Mohan Roy was limited only to the field of social reforms. His political ideas were also very advanced for his times. In fact, his ideas will give the cue to later day nationalists. Many of his ideas will become fervent demands by Indian political leaders as we advance towards formation of Indian National Congress. What were some of his political ideas? Let us now 
try to have a look. He vehemently criticized the Bengal zamindars. We have discussed earlier how the zamindars were a very powerful class in the Indian society. The British policies had made them all the more powerful, reducing the peasants uh, you know, to abject poverty and exploitation by the zamindars. Raja Ram Mohan Roy had the empathy to actually see this situation from the perspective of the peasants who were virtually just tenants of these big zamindars. So he criticized the evil practices of the Bengal zamindars. He demanded abolition of companies' trading rights, something that the Britishers, you know, realized later and then finally all the trading rights of East India Company were abolished. East India Company was playing a dual role. It was a political power and at the same time it was trading. Now this naturally was a conflict of interest. The political power was abused by the East India Company to favor its trading goals. Raja Ram Mohan Roy understood that as long as the company has both the powers, both the roles, there will be economic exploitation. So he advocates the ending of trading rights of East India Company. He demanded its removal completely, removal of heavy export duties on Indian goods. The one-way free trade that was imposed on India, especially after Charter Act of 1813. This one-way free trade where British goods could come to India with very nominal custom duties. But when Indian goods went there, there was a huge 200-400% custom duty on Indian goods. This was patently unfair and therefore Raja Ram Mohan Roy strongly opposed this. He asked for Indianization of services. Services were heavily, uh, you know, drawing from Europeans. Indians, they did not rise to any significant position in the British administration. Raja Ram Mohan Roy will fervently argue for more and more Indianization of the British services, whether it may be civil services or uh, in terms of the military services. He demanded freedom of press. Himself a pioneer of journalism, he expected that freedom of press will be extended to Indians, which had been curbed during Lord Wellesley's times. Lord Wellesley, he had passed certain strictures, regulations to control the press. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who was a journalist and used to come out with Sambad comedy, Bangadut and Miratul Akhbar. This was in Persian. All of these were his publications. So he demanded freedom of press for Indians so that they could express themselves freely. He argued for separation of executive from the judiciary. The Britishers had once again combined the post of revenue collector and collector being an important position in the judicial system. Raja Ram Mohan Roy felt that there is clear conflict of interest in this process. So we need to segregate, we need to separate these two. He also supported trial by jury and equality between Indian and European judges. Indians had been allowed to enter in the judicial system, but they were at very low ranks. They could not rise beyond the rank of Sadar Amin. Sadar Amin was the highest rank at this point that they could rise to. This inequality between Indian judges and European judges, that had to be addressed. It will take a long time before this is done. The entire Ilbert Bill controversy in 1880s will be because of this attempt for equalization. And Raja Ram Mohan Roy was talking about this in 1810s and 1820s. So you can see he was a man way, way ahead of his time. Raja Ram Mohan Roy went on to establish an organization called as Brahmo Samaj, about which we must know. Let us now talk about Brahmo Samaj. He first established Atmiya Sabha in 1814 and later in 1828, he will establish the Brahmo Samaj for popularizing his ideas. This was the first socio-religious reform movement in India, which was based on concept or ideas of the Western world. Raja Ram Mohan Roy tried to popularize his thoughts, his ideas 
through the Brahmo Samaj. What were these? We have already seen his core ideas. A quick overview about what Brahmo Samaj focused on. It was committed to one eternal God, that is monotheism, which was so central in Raja Ram Mohan Roy's ideas. He opposed priestly class domination, idolatry, caste system, sati, polygamy, and other exploitative practices against women. He promoted widow remarriage and female education. He challenged many dogmas, rituals, and superstitions of his times. He condemned Hindu prejudice against going abroad. The upper caste amongst Hindus had a prejudice about going abroad, crossing the sea because of loss of the caste status. He condemned that. He was instrumental in giving or at least trying to provide a respectable position to women in the society. It will take some time till that position is achieved, but at least the efforts were now started during his time itself. He attacked casteism and especially the practice of untouchability. These were all ideas that were very radical for their times. And naturally, this led to a reaction from the more orthodox elements of the society. Dharma Sabha, an organization, was created for the sake of opposing the ideas of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Raja Radha Kant Dev created or started this organization basically to counter the message of the Brahmo Samaj. So that the ideas of Brahmo Samaj would not become popular, Raja Radha Kant Dev had started the Dharma Sabha. I hope you got this guys. After the death of Raja Ram Mohan Roy, his work was later carried forward by Devendranath Tagore. Devendranath Tagore, who is the father of Satyendranath and Rabindranath Tagore, very legendary family of uh, you know, Bengal at that time. A lot of illustrious uh, names from that family can be cited. So he will continue the ideas of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. He first started the Tattva Bodhini Sabha in 1839 with the aim of propagating Raja Ram Mohan Roy's ideas. He wanted to counter the influence of Christianity. In these times, the young Bengalis who had taken to modern Western education had become allured by Christianity. Already Charter Act of 1813 had allowed missionaries to come and preach in India and therefore there was a rising attraction of Christianity. So he tried to counter that and popularize Raja Ram Mohan Roy's ideas. He advocated Vedantism and Indian culture as the way of life for Indians. For popularizing his ideas, he started the Tattva Bodhini Press and also Tattva Bodhini Patrika, a publication for his ideas. In 1843, he becomes the member of Brahmo Samaj. And he will bring in a new life into that body. Through his energy, we will see that Brahmo Samaj will spread to other parts of Bengal. Branches of it will come up, come up in many different cities. And also, some will penetrate into rural areas of Bengal as well. So, Brahmo Samaj will see a lot of spread during the times of Devendranath Tagore. All right? The next person about whom we must know is Keshap Chandra Sen, who will you know, take Brahmo Samaj to a very different level. He joined Brahmo Samaj in 1858 and was made a Acharya, that is a leader, by Devendranath Tagore himself. He brought a energy and dynamism like never before to the organization. He went on a worldwide, a worldwide tour of India and interacted with people from many different regions. Consequently, branches of the Samaj came up in UP, Punjab, Madras and other areas, Bombay also. Prarthna Samaj was established in the wake of this visit that Keshav Chandra Sen had done in Bombay. He stressed on women's education and focused on universalism. This is an important term guys universalism which means the core or essence of all religions is the same 
your universalism means religious universalism please have that at the back of your mind this idea of re religious universalism was not liked by Debendranath Tagore who was more a traditionalist and wanted Vedantic ideas to be the core of Brahmo Samaj. This conflict turned ugly and finally Keshav Chandra Sen was removed from Brahmo Samaj and from that post of Acharya after which Brahmo Samaj will split up between the followers of the two. Keshav Chandra Sen created Brahmo Samaj of India as a new organization with his followers whereas Devendranath Tagore continued the earlier body now renamed as Adi Brahmo or original Brahmo. Later on Keshav Chandra Sen's followers became disgusted by him as he married his young daughter to the Maharaja of Kuch Bihar with all elaborate rituals and uh, you know involvement of a uh, priestly class. So they felt that he had not lived up to his own ideas and this will lead to further split in his organization that is Brahmo Samaj of India. Now lastly we will briefly discuss about the contribution of another great reformer from Bengal that is Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar was a great scholar and social reformer. Born in a very humble and modest background, he struggled very hard to get the best education that he could in those times. He blended Indian and Western thought much like Raja Ram Mohan Roy. He believed in the greatness of Indian thought and civilization and at the same time was humble and realistic enough to see what was good in the West. He went on to become the principal of Sanskrit College in 1850, Sanskrit College in 1850, where he had himself studied. Sanskrit College, originally it was established in Banaras, but later its branches had been established elsewhere, including in Calcutta also. His ideas, he broke the priestly monopoly of scriptural knowledge. He was himself from the priestly class, but then he was a man of great integrity. He saw that this domination of scriptural knowledge by the priests is unfair, is unhealthy for the society. So he broke that monopoly, that domination and he opened Sanskrit college to non-Brahmins also. He introduced Western thought in Sanskrit learning. Western thought in Sanskrit learning. He evolved new methodology of teaching Sanskrit and wrote a Bengali primer also. Rajaram Mohan Roy had also written it, but later Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar also rose, wrote a Bengali primer and developed a new prose style for writing in Bengali. He used to come out with a newspaper called as the Shom Prakash, uh, which enabled him to spread his ideas to the masses. Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar was especially famous, or you know, he's more important for the role that he played for women. He promoted and legalized widow remarriage. In 1856, because of his efforts, the British government legalized widow remarriage, which was a very, very landmark, significant, seminal move in empowerment of women in India. He crusaded against child marriage, polygamy and other evils that held women back. He campaigned for increasing education for women. He himself organized 35 girls school and became a pioneer for higher education for women in India. He was also the secretary of the famous Bethune school. A multifaceted personality, Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. Vidya Sagar was by the way his title. You know, Vidya Sagar as the title itself literally means a person who is an ocean of knowledge. That was the kind of man that he was and he definitely played a very crucial role in the early phase of socio-religious reform movements in India. In our next session, we will continue this discussion of socio-religious reform movements and see other movements that took place in the 19th century. If you've liked this lecture, if you found value in it, then don't forget to smash that like button and leave some love in the comment box below. I'll see you in my next class. Thank you.